You're listening to Split the Defense, a Toronto Maple Leafs, Colorado Avalanche, and NHL podcast. Hosted by Jordan Webster, Craig Pierce, and producer Ted Evans. Split the Defense is presented by LaForest Electrical Contractors. Professional and efficient service since 2004. Serving the Kingston and surrounding areas. What up? Welcome to Split the Defense Hockey Podcast. I'm Webby with CP and producer Ted. And we are here to chat about the Leafs going to California. But we're also going to talk about a couple other things because uh, last show got cut short. Uh, but before we get started, please take a second, drop a like on the, on the episode, subscribe to our YouTube Rate of five stars on whatever podcasting platform you're consuming from. Follow us on all the social medias. We're at STDP Hockey on X. And just look for Split the Defense anywhere else. We're there. Um, so let's go ahead and get it started with the Leafs, boys. We are going back to back in Cali. And <laughs> that reminds me of a song, doesn't it? Going, <laughs> doesn't going, matter. back, back to... Yeah, anyways. Um, <laughs> so Jones starts it out with a 31-save shutout against L.A. on Tuesday. And then he lets in one goal against in the second game of the back-to-back because he played both. Now, Dennis Hildeby was recalled, as we talked about, and he didn't get the start. No. So Jones ended up playing both back-to-back games while they were in California. And he was phenomenal. So does that change your opinion on the Leafs goaltending situation or as you are you as worried for this time that we have to wait for wool now or does that uh, change your opinion at all I mean I it makes me feel a little more comfortable just because he's he's put on quite the display I they're like one Anaheim's maybe not the best team but you know had to face quite a bit of chances and the game against LA I feel like he was a, a big factor in that one obviously so yeah, it makes me feel more comfortable, but I still think like we need to do something. I'm not sure that Samsonov is going to be the solution as a backup even, and uh, it just doesn't seem like they're giving Hill to be the the chance. Like there is Petrozelli down in the minors. If you want to bring up a younger guy who you know you don't have to worry about like the development as much as you do Hill to be, because that's my biggest thing is if he has to sit as the backup, then he's not playing. And like he's having a career year, um, really showing that he can do it on North American ice, and and I I feel like he, like I don't, I'm sh- not sure what the plan is really at the moment. I think it's a wait and see what Samsonov does, but I have no faith in that way. But very happy with how Jones has played. I mean, looking back, what a what a move to to have this guy on the roster even right. Like there's a scenario where he's not a Leaf because we had to put him through waivers. So. What a nightmare we'd be in in that case. So I'm I'm just feeling thankful that he was on the team. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, it's nice to know that uh, Martin Jones is capable of this type of play. Um, whether it's sustainable or not, that's a question. Um, but right now we have to figure that out because it doesn't look like this current uh, GM, maybe it's the coach, they don't trust the rookie in. They're not ready to put him in. Um, now that's not saying he won't get a game. Um, cause we don't know how long Samsonov's actually going to be down there. I'm sure. I think there's a set period of time he's down there for right now. Um, but as for right now, we don't know. So he might end up being there till wool gets back. He might end up having to play a game, get a little more acclimated to the team, uh, get used to the defensive structure, um, and stop a bunch of pucks hopefully. And the coaches like him, and they put him in. But as for right now, it's nice to see that Martin Jones can hold the fort because the Leafs have nobody else. And he's doing exceptional. He's not just doing uh, good enough. Um, like he's he's pretty much uh, letting in a three or four goal a game for the last while. Now it's time to step up. He really stepped up here in California, right? Oh yeah. I think also like uh, if I'm taking a step back and looking over like our last couple podcasts, I think there's and how Leafs Nation has reacted in general. I think there's definitely been some overreaction with the Samsonov stuff, just because necessarily like like let's see, take the abs and for because ted knows so much about them for instance mm-hmm, mm-hmm. if they had lost like we lost joseph wall who we think is going to be our starter if if the abs lost georgie it would be a nightmare right 
Like, I mean, it wouldn't be a scenario where you're looking at your third goalie and saying, are we comfortable with him? And at the moment, like we're looking at our, our now backup, if we are saying Samsonov isn't and it's Jones. So Jones is our backup and he's doing a stellar job. And so like, we're just waiting now for our, our starter goalie to come back, but it's not uncommon for you to have your goalie go down. And then now your backup is not someone that you're so confident in. Right. I think the best part about Martin Jones is that he's played like a lot of games. I, I can't even remember. Yeah. It's like over 400 games um, that he's played in the NHL. So he's not just some uh, guy trying to find it, that they're giving a chance that might be something someday. He's been to a Stanley Cup final. Like he's right. got that in him. He knows how to play. He knows what it looks like to get that far. And I just think that uh, that gives you some confidence and some hope going forward with this Leafs goalie thing. Um, so to get into the game, CP, yeah. um, the Maple Leafs, this is Luke Fox's tweet. Maple Leafs are gifted with a depleted Ducks lineup. No Radko Gudis. Ross Johnson are, is ill. Ryan Strom has an upper body injury and Troy Terry has been placed on IR. Also, Anaheim is starting backup. Lucas Dostal in net. Gifted, he says. Gifted. <laughs> yeah. The next Luke Fox I, tweet I have underneath here is Lucas Dostal's 54 saves is a Ducks record. It right. ended up being 57. Wow. So, Lucas Dostal, uh, that guy had a night. Now, I know this is totally typical of the Toronto Maple Leafs to go in and play the backup goalie. Um, like we, we seen some tweets that we, uh, uh, talked about before. Um, it could just be random McRandomson goes in and he's going to brick wall up the, the Leafs. And then you can have the best goalie in the world starter and they can beat Andre Vasilevsky in the best of seven, you know, like it's, it's crazy to see how that always works, but Lucas Dostal deserves a lot of credit for the way he played. He was calm and collected is what I'd like to say for as much as he was moving around. You could see when he started to lose it at the end, they started to get to him. He started to flip and flop a little bit and they finally got to him, but it took like 50 minutes before any of that happened. Yeah, 50 definitely. Minutes I mean, 50 shots. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I think there's only fantasy uh, people that play fantasy hockey know who who Dostal is, you know, because like he's a guy that's kind of floated on a few people's rosters on backup nights. Right. Um, yeah. But if you're not if you don't play fantasy hockey, you probably have no idea who this guy was. And you think that it's just some random guy who, you know, is just putting on a show. But I mean, he's a real goalie. Like, let's give him some credit. Oh, yeah. He's not like some just Joe Blow here. Like this is a, a young goalie who has a bright future ahead of him and has taken starts from uh, Gibson at times in this season. So, I mean, he's not nobody. Um, Gibson's yeah. not been good. So, yeah, they're like looking for Dostel to be their guy of the future. Absolutely. Um, yeah. He's yeah. no schlub, um, but it's just something that you kind of expect. As soon as the backup guy who doesn't get to play, maybe a little bit of chip on his shoulder, maybe the up-and-comer, it doesn't matter. His name could be whatever. If it's yeah. not the starting goalie, uh, then you're probably going to get a loss from the lease. And it's just funny how that always happens. Right? Pretty lazy. Um, but 57 saves, man. At one point, like, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was, like, 45 saves or 46 saves. I know they scored on their 50th shot, right? That was when they, they put the, the goal in. But I thought around 46 or 47 huh i wonder what the record is you pull up twitter and steve dangle says oh well the record for a shutout it saves is 59 i'm like oh of course somebody else is thinking about that too so then yeah. i went on twitter and just furiously started typing shutout and like lucas dostal is looking like he's gonna get a shutout tonight going in comment sections of everybody talking about it like yeah he'll get a shutout get a shutout ted and i are texting back and forth we said shut out like 18 times <laughs> finally a couple of shots later they got one through um, it worked. But what a night from that guy. Uh, 57 saves in the end. And the Leafs, like, I'm, I'm going to jump around here a little bit. The first period, they were playing hard to start the game. They're buzzing around the duck zone. At the end of the first period, per natural stat trick, the Leafs had 12 high danger chances. Yeah, I saw that. It's crazy. 12. They only gave <laughs> up one, which is amazing defensively, too. But, like, the Ducks aren't exactly world beaters offensively. But, like... Oh my God, 12. That's a lot for one period. That's a game's worth in one period. 
Um, so for Lucas Dostel to not let anything in during that period, that was unbelievable for him. Um, he honestly, like, if if he can play like that and uh, he plays like that more often, um, he's definitely going to have a bright future in Anaheim. Yeah, definitely. Goalie of the future, for sure. Definitely. Uh, so Nikki Robertson was scratched. Um, we had Holmberg dress in. Uh, first, what do you what do you guys think of Nick Robertson being scratched after all the talk and love we give to him on this show? And um, what do you predict from Holmberg, CP, watching this guy in the last couple of years? I mean, like I've been a, a bit of a Holmberg hater in my day. Um, I mean, I, I've called him lazy. I've been kind of ruthless to him. Um, probably undeserved, but um, just like the things that I've heard on different shows and things like that. So I just, I'm not a huge fan. I think that he could potentially turn himself into a David Camp type player, but there's no way that I think that he has a spot on the third line left wing next to Domi. You know, it's just, there's a whole lot of nothing going on when he's out there and that's fine for a certain type of player. Um, but like, he's not that player yet. He's not defensive responsible. Like camp is normally. Um, so I, I, I don't think it's a placeholder. It's just scratching a guy. He's it's another keep scratching. I, I just feel like he, he picked a guy and, and, uh, like, and I predicted that he's not going to do this again because of the camp situation. And I think he picked a guy that nobody is really going to make a big deal about because, you know, no one's real surprised if Robertson is in and out of the lineup, really. So, but I don't think that putting Holmberg in there is like some solution to a problem or anything. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, I thought, honestly, I never thought it was about the uh, the whole scratching because he did something wrong. Um, now Nick Robertson played like less than ten minutes the game before, uh, so it made sense. Um, obviously, some keeps seeing something he doesn't like. Um, or it's just not working right now. Uh, I don't think he's like, he's not waiver eligible, so he can go down without any waivers and yeah. he can just be playing in the American league and maybe like, just go Dom. You haven't had a full season. Go Dom down there for the rest of the year. Just go light it up and then come back next year and be dope. Like why, why can't you just go like, you haven't had a full season since he's turned pro and if maybe this is the year where you're going to stay healthy, go down to the American league and tear it up again. Like, just absolutely tear it up. Build your confidence. Keep working out. Next year, you'll be one year older, one year wiser, one year stronger. And come and try then because we still have your rights. Right? Like, I don't know. I think maybe that's just probably the best thing. Um, Holmberg, I really have no idea what that guy is. I remember thinking, like, oh, he might have offensive upside. But, like, that went away real quick. Yeah. Um, and then he started taking penalties. Keith kicked him out of the lineup. I really don't know what to think of that guy. <laughs> It really shows when you put a guy like Holmberg in that the Leafs need a third line left winger. <laughs> yeah. They need or at like least... a, a legit third line left winger. Somebody who goes, he could even play on the second line. Mm -hmm. Somebody like that. Like, or at least put Noah Gregor there instead of Holmberg. You know, like I would have been much work. happier with that because at least he does stuff. You know, there would have been pucks on that. He would have shot the puck. Um, I feel like that was a missing part of Holmberg is he just doesn't shoot. He doesn't look to shoot. He's just, yeah, where Gregor, that's all he's looking to do. He literally, as soon as he crossed that blue line, it's how do I get this puck on that? So I would have been much happier with that. But yeah, I think in the long run, like we are missing a, a left winger. If Robert Robertson hasn't been anything special, right? He does a lot of stuff, um, good and bad. So I feel like, you know, he, he still has some learning to do. I, if he does way more of the good, I think we're all a lot happier with with this play. It's just there's a lot of turnovers and and other mistakes. So I just I think that yeah, you're right. We are kind of missing one. But for the meantime, let's put Gregor there. Yeah, actually, I think that would work. I thought about that earlier. Max Domi and uh, Gregor and Yarncroke. Yeah, that could be a good line. Um, I think that might actually work as a third line because Gregor might be proving to be that type of player. Um, I certainly think he's underutilized playing fourth line 5v5 minutes. Um, but he is kind of thrown... He has been thrown out there with other players, is, is what I'm saying. It's not been exclusively one line and two guys he's played with. He definitely has mixed around. He even had a chance on the top line. Um, but yeah, I think that would make sense. Throw him on the third line. Um, so 
to start off the game, a lot of talk about uh, the anthem that went on. Yeah. And uh, so Dave Hill did a, uh, we'll call it a Jimi Hendrix impression-esque uh, national anthem uh, on his guitar. And when he first started playing, I was like, this is sick. <laughs> like, I had no problems with it. I thought it was dope. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Um, it was the kid in me. He's like, oh, this is awesome. It was drawn out, and I can see why people complained. But it was good. Like, I, I liked it. I thought it was fun um, to learn. He's a comedian, too, at the same time. Mm -hmm. You wonder how much he's putting that into it as well. And I think that's even more fun. Um, but William Nylander, which I saw, and Tyler Bertuzzi as well, they were both cracking up on the bench. They were yeah. they couldn't contain themselves. They couldn't compose themselves to get through the anthem because this was just, at some points, it was just wailing with the whammy bar. Um, but it was really fun. Like, did you think it was fun or dumb or what do you think? I mean, I, I wanted to love it. That's what I said to you is I wanted to love it. And as soon as he came out, I was like, yes, let's just shred an anthem. This is going to be awesome. I'm picking the under on this on this anthem always. And then it, it was a little bit drawn out, you know, like by the end of it, I was just like, OK, like this isn't your moment, you know, like, yeah, but, I know. <laughs> but I you know, know, it was fun. I, it's fun doing something different. Right. But yeah. What do you think, Ted? um that's it is the uh, just like that it's something different um i saw jack white do an anthem recently um all on guitar and yeah, like sly guitar that. and some of it gets you know like uh gets out there uh but that's that's his thing and uh the fact that this guy was a com is like is a comedian and had some of the guys on the bench cracking up i mean yeah that that's fun i love that yeah that made me feel better about the drawn out part of it because I was like, yeah. oh, but like, I wish I knew that in the moment because I like would have loved it, you know? Like, if you're like watching, I found out knowing like that this eight hours a... later. <laughs> yeah. If you're watching, he's like a comedian you follow. You're sitting there like just cracking up being like, he's doing yeah. his bit. Like, this is great. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. Of course he would. Yeah. Of course he could have just went through this and instead he's like, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, like, come on, man. <laughs> like, yeah. it, was, it was pretty funny if you think about it in that way yeah that's um, nothing to be upset about that's for sure <laughs> no definitely not so mcmahon hit uh mintikov at one mm. point in the game he i honestly was confused at this um dangerous play i mean he's he's going to finish his check um not really what you'd expect i guess um but he sent him and he got a boarding call and I guess I'm just learning the rules all completely and totally, but <laughs> I'm not. But the boarding, I thought you had to push somebody into the boards because he checked him shoulder on shoulder and then his skates turned and he went whoop into the boards <laughs> like a cartoon, <laughs> right? And that's really what I saw. And I'm like, D is that boarding? Like, you want to call him roughing? Maybe like he shouldn't hit him. Or like, I don't know, call it something. But like, is that boarding? Was that boarding? Am I wrong? Or was that like, I mean, I think it is boarding. Like we were talking, we've talked about this gray area before, you know, it's like this when you're like two to four feet away from the board. It was like six like, or eight though. Yeah, actually. Yeah. You might be right. I mean, he wasn't much he was. farther. His momentum carried him on his skates. His skates went like whoop, woo. Yeah. Right into the I, boards. To me, it was more of like what the contact was and how it was created. Like if we're talking about if it's boarding or not, I like I I don't know. I, it's hard for me to really say. Should it be a game, ten minute game misconduct? I like I. That's where when when this hit happened and they're reviewing it, when they gave him the five minute, I was like, okay. I I don't know if this is going to be a two minute or if he's going to be suspended for three games because just like the NHL has zero consistency, and now we're in this gray area call where now we're just like it's someone's opinion basically, and they're like watching it frame by frame which I thought was the oddest thing. Like, just like watch it a few times and you can tell, like he hits him like on the shoulder as he's kind of trying to protect himself and turning. And so he's, it's, I don't want to blame it all on Mintikov because like he's trying to shoot the puck and I get that. And then like, it's an instinct to kind of do that play. But I like, I don't put it on McMahon and I want him to make that hit 10 times out of 10, like throw that hit. Cause like the player is putting if the player doesn't want to be in that position then like pull up and just chip it because like you can see him coming that's what you want him to do next time and that's kind of the point yeah. of it right you, and like it's it sucks that he got hurt and he got cut 
Sure. But like, and I just don't think that, in my opinion, it's when boarding is when you take a guy and you drive him into the boards because you were boarding him. That's what I thought for my watching the game and how it's always been. It's never been like, I, I, I guess I push you or I hit you and then you are six or eight feet away. You skate and slide and fall and kind of hit the boards and that's boarding. Roughing, whatever, whatever. I guess we shouldn't argue semantics. Um, but I really just didn't understand why it was a boarding call. I kind of thought it was clean, but like it was a rough hit. I will, I will give, I will be fair. Like I wouldn't want to take that hit. Like I'd be super no. happy we got that he got kicked out of the game for that. Like good, fuck you. That hurts, right? <laughs> so like, I was I willing mean, to accept the two minute penalty. Like if you just had a two minute, I would have been like, yeah, fine, whatever. Like it's a a fifty fifty one, you know, but. For them to just make it a 10 minute game misconduct. And I also thought Labushkin like shouldn't have got a game misconduct either for jumping in and Oh no, to here's fight the best either. part. Yeah, okay. So let's talk about that. So Ilya Labushkin comes in uh to uh what do you want to call it? Like protect him, to avenge him. Um yeah. and he goes after Bobby McMahon. Um so they both get five for fighting, but Ilya Labushkin also gets a game misconduct. Um and he got two for an instigator. Um, so it also gave the Leafs two minutes off the five minute major that, um, Bobby got for boarding, but, but the best part is this happened a few weeks ago Yeah, and it looks like a trend and I like it because just because a big hit was thrown doesn't mean you need to start a fight right now. And I just have the, I just have the one counter and I'm 90% always on board with what you just said, but it is a, a kind of a close call. And like where it is like half into the boards and the guy goes face first into the boards. And so on these type of instances, I don't mind the, the, the player going and, and, you know, scrumming it up. And I guess it's all up to like, I guess if you want to rule it, the instigator out, then like you got to do it all. But like, this is one where it bugs me because like his, like it's a Mintikov is a young, he's a rookie and you know, it's a veteran in Labushkin that's out there with him. And that's his job is to protect him. So I feel like I like the two minute instigator when it's a scenario, but the 10 minute just seems like it's so much, you know, yeah, like, well, it's, it's for being an idiot. And he was back out on the ice, wasn't he later in the game? Um, and it was like, it made no sense for him to, for him to not do it. Like it, it's, it's a precedent that is being set in the NHL, right? This is what they're supposed to do now when like, it's been 24 hours. This clean, this hit has been obviously deemed clean or his punishment has been served we haven't heard a dang thing about it i think we would have by now about his hearing or something or something Uh, i may be wrong by the time the episode comes out but like i'm pretty sure that the league would have looked at it by now if they thought it was bad he would be in there and serving a suspension or something um and nothing of that has come so i have to wonder like maybe the refs saw it that way too and then they see Ilya Labushkin go in and for a fight, and they're like, "No, you're dumb. This is we're stopping this. We don't like this anymore. Stop being an idiot. You can't just go fight just because your guy got hit and he got hurt. Like he, it was hit on the shoulder. It's not like he went head contact. You go back, no. he got him cleaned on the shoulder. He didn't go on his numbers. Like he wasn't didn't have his hands on his back. He didn't push out on him. He drove shoulder to shoulder, and he sent him into the into the boards. And like he wasn't two feet away with his head close. He was like good six feet away from the boards." So, like, I don't know. It's a lot of it. Maybe the ref, I think I, I'm on the side of, right? I think that I, I, I'm thinking that they're on my side right now when I'm saying all this. But I think maybe they looked at Labushkin and was like, yeah, well, you're dumb. So you go away for 10 minutes too. And I think that's the end of that. Yeah. I, I like, I'm I just going to take me some time to get around to it because it just feels so, so, like, such a drastic switch because we just got used to the two minute instigator. Like, we had that even hasn't been. Like it's the call, the penalty has been around forever, but them calling it has been more recent. And so to just jump it up to, uh, to the, the 10 just seems like a lot. Yeah. Well, but I mean, I wasn't I don't know. disappointed. Maybe in it. six months, I'm going to be like, it was the best thing for hockey because now there's way more hits being thrown. And if that's the case, yeah. then like it's, I can't argue with it because I love big hits. So, and like fighting happens here and there, but it's not as, as, uh, it's not as pat like it doesn't um uh, like i find that fans get really hyped up and are way more passionate about big hits and the game in general is a better product versus we like love it one 10 second little fight right 
Yeah, I know in 10 seconds or 30 seconds or whatever. And a lot of the times they're brutally bad. You want to see a good fight, you got to go down to a lower level where they just punch each other's heads in. Like AHL fights, amazing. (laughs) AHL fights are still great. They're wonderful. Oh, yeah. And junior fights, oh, yeah, those kids are ruthless. Absolutely. Go watch a Frontenax game. There was like three or four fights in that game against the Gens, the home opener this year. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Those kids are just punching each other right in the head. Just bam, 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 just old school. Um, so, I mean, like, yeah, I think it, it would make more sense because I don't want to throw a hit if I'm going to go get my ass kicked every time I do, right? So I'm going to hit less, um, at least big hits and those those hits that are exciting to the fans. So you might be right. That might uh, cause people, like players, to want to hit more. I never even thought of it that way. And you might get someone like Matthews willing to just, like, lay someone out. Oh, he out. already does. He did last like, night. like, really lay people out, you know? <laughs> like, that's what I want to see is guys who are just, that, yeah, just don't want to fight. Or, like, Nylander, you know? Like, there's no way that he wants to be in a fight, but he's got a body where he could throw a massive hit, and he just doesn't do it. So it, maybe if he wasn't worried about anyone getting in his face, then he would just do it. Yeah, maybe. I don't even think that would bother Nylander, though. Like, you just be like, I'm not going to fight you. I'm just skating yeah. away. <laughs> yeah. Like, get out of here. <laughs> You're right, actually. Whatever. Yeah. He doesn't get bothered by anything. Yeah. Um. So just to f- wrap up the Leafs here, I only got a couple more things. Um. The Maple Leafs extend the NHL's longest active streak without being shut out to 181 games on the yeah, 50th unreal. shot of the night. 181 games without a shutout. So. Wow. Yeah, that's and the next is active streak right now is Boston, and they're like seventy-seven or something. They're like one hundred and ten yeah. games back. Like, that's insane! Wow, that's so yeah. many games. Holy, yeah, it's so I was. It really felt like a night. Um, like so to go back to Labushkin. Um, remember when he saved that one right on the line? Oh, yeah. uh, I thought that like, Matthews was trying to tuck it in around the corner, and uh, Labushkin's stick was just perfectly placed. Um, I thought at that point, uh oh, like that's probably like this is this could be a long night. Like they might not score a couple more shots later, and I was thinking this this is bad. Like this could be a four nothing for the Leafs or four one for the Leafs. Um, and later on in the game, it didn't even occur to me that he might get a shutout because the game was low scoring, but it was still intense. Like there was a lot going on, and it was a lot of fun. Um, but then you notice like uh oh, he might get a shutout. Um, and the Leafs come through like they do every time, right? That's, I guess that's the whole point. You get all worried and 181 games, like it's just kind of proof this team's going to get one goal because as we know, sometime in the last 10 minutes, if they haven't scored, they're going to turn it on and get one. That's just how it works in Toronto. Um, I did like to, like, just like my last thought in the game is that the, um, they really changed their, their, uh, plan in the late I can't even speak in the end of the game they really changed their plan of attack um, and because there's a lot of shots on net I know that there's there's a lot of activity but there's so much room for the goalie and like direct lines of sight where you could just track the puck and then that immediately like something changed I think they may have there was a talking to from the coach or something because yeah they started getting bodies in front and kind of scored a goal like how you have to in the playoffs when things aren't really going right. Like the goalie just has having way more trouble seeing. And like when you said like he was starting to flop a little bit more and it's like because he's he's not able to track the puck as well. And I thought that that was a really good change for them. And I like want to see more of that where like when things aren't going well, like a change of attack here. Do you remember Sheldon Keefe's quote that said, uh, well, we're getting a lot of clean looks, but they're too clean. Right. That's really what it was. They had a lot of clean looks, a lot of good shots on that, but they were too clean, right? Like right between the, uh, and then they, what they did, if that change of plan of attack, as you're talking about, uh, when they flipped the switch, um, they started getting guys in front. They started making the extra pass because what they were doing is they were all firing, which you normally want on your team, right? You want the guys to fire on net. It sometimes the Leafs problems in the past have been the extra pass, but last night that was what they needed. They needed the extra pass, and once they started doing that, they started causing problems for Dostal, and I wonder if that's when he started to either fatigue or maybe get in his head um, because a couple went off the bar uh, or right past him that were inches um, before, J- before JT clapped that one in that was a Riley shot off the bar. 
But mm. uh, a few of them went by, and I wonder if that's when he started to get shaky is really when they started to put those guys in front and make it more difficult for the goalie to see the puck because, like, God forbid you don't go and do what's happening to you all the time. So your whole goalie's now down in the AHL because everybody's in front of him and he can't stop a puck from distance. Like, I don't know, guys, maybe take a page out of that book and go and try that. Right? I just thought <laughs> it made like sense. like me during like, the Canada check game. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that was tough. <laughs> that was absolutely tough. Um, but like it, you needed to, they needed to do more than they were doing. Like you see some of the scarier teams. Like I remember watching the Pittsburgh Penguins in their prime, um, the 15, 16, even 14, like they were so good. Um, and then you have other teams like I can think of Tampa Bay with Kuz, um, with, um, Kucherov. I can think of Washington with, uh, you yeah, the guys like Kuznetsov and Ovi and the quick tap passes, the quick, um, when you think they're going to shoot and they have a perfect pop, a bang, it was too much. I feel to Austin Matthews. What did he end the night with? 14 shots on goal. <laughs> Matthews yeah, had crazy. last night. Yeah. Like 20, 20 on net. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, or around the net. Attempts. Sorry. Yeah, 20, 20 attempts. Yeah. And 14 hit the net. Like yeah. that's nuts. Um, crazy. That's crazy. He ended up winning it at OT, right? Um, beautiful, like same shot he'd taken six times that night. And that one finally went in, but it was three on three. It's a different uh, beast. Um, oh, by the way, stat, um, Matthew's highest shots ever in a game is 15 last year against Carolina. Oh. Um, so he was close to matching his career record for shots in that game. He was buzzing. He got a lot of clean shots, but they were too clean. Um, so let's finish off here with Austin Matthews so we can get out of this segment. Um, per natural stat trick, Austin Matthews had an all situations expected goals for of 4.37 last night. So he should have scored f- over four goals himself wow. yeah. independently. Like that's crazy. Um, he's got 30 goals now and it was January 3rd when he scored his 30th. That's silly in 35 games. Like what? And in 35 games, here's the crazy part. That was his first game-winning goal. Can you believe that? <laughs> no, that's so unbelievable. They flashed that stat right away, and I couldn't believe it. Like, you, how is that even possible? And I mean, like, the, he scores a lot of important goals, so let's not get it wrong. But for one of them not to end up being the game winner is kind of crazy. I mean, for when you have 14 shot attempts, like, that's, like, not – it's hard to get four, you know? Like, a lot of players struggle to get four shots on that. And he just, he's in the past like month, actually, I think it was Sheldon, I think it was Sheldon Keefe who asked him to take more of an initiative to put pucks on net. Um, and, uh, and like, he's really done that and it's obviously working for him where you said that like he, you don't want to clean up looks. He's like the one guy who I don't mind, like take any look you want because you could, he has the ability to, to beat any goaltender at any moment. But, uh, but definitely, so in obvious. general, the, the too clean works for almost everybody else in the league. <laughs> it's so obvious that it's going to Matthews so much, though, and I think that might have been a lot of, like, 14 of those shots were from Austin Matthews last night on Dostal when he was 57, so he actually stopped 43 from the rest of the team, right? 14 shots, and I think he probably knew 13 of them were coming. Right. Yeah. The 14th. That's fine, uh, maybe I think he even knew the 14th was coming and he probably couldn't get there. But like it's it's so obvious sometimes that they're going to cycle the puck to Austin Matthews. Um, and then it's like, oh, it's not Matthews. Let's mix it up. Oh, it's on Nylander stick. All right. So it's one of those two guys like the everybody else just kind of touch passes, gets in the spot, gets in the dirty. And it's like Willie and Austin are, are running around out there and then cycle in Mitch to make some bumper plays. Um, like, I feel like that's just a power play issue, though. Like, and in general, I think their power play has been awful. I, that's not a, a critique on Matthews himself. I think in general he's been amazing, but the power play is just missing something. I think I saw he was under fifteen percent in December, which is like you know that's not good enough. It's uh, not and bad with the, now. especially it's, with it's the like players, no fifteen percent in just just in December. You know, not uh, total. Like, yeah, uh, um, yeah, that's not good. Yeah, that's so, bad. Yeah, it's bad. So I don't know. There's something missing there. Like like you said with with Tampa, uh, like they just snap that puck around so fast, you can hardly tell where it's going. Um, Kucherov is probably the best power play player in the entire league. 
Uh, and I wish Marner play, even five on five. It feels like a power play sometimes because they have them hemmed in their own zone, right? Like you've seen that, especially the Leafs and their defensive woes. Um, having them hemmed in their own zone and seeing these teams like the Penguins or the Capitals in their prime or the Tampa Bay Lightning, as we just mentioned. Um, the, all those teams have had those gamer players who you can't really tell where it's going to go and they're make, they think so quickly um, to make these moves and get in the right position. Uh, and I just really wish that it was less obvious. Like, I mean, even with Ovi on the team, um, I remember seeing lots of other players score goals when the uh, Capitals were in their prime, right? And you weren't always necessarily, I'm not talking um, power play because it's quite obvious it was going to Ovi on the power play and the goalie still couldn't stop it. Um, but it, even five on five, I remember seeing other guys and thinking, holy crap, like Washington's not just Ovechkin, right? Like they had guys and I, I Kuznetsov specifically, I remember. He's a dick. Like I remember watching him. He's so fucking crafty. Like he, I, in his prime, in his like heyday when they were winning the cup in the couple years before when they, we played them in the playoffs, Kuznetsov was an elite center. Like he was really fucking good passing the puck around and I really didn't know where it was going to go and I just wish that there was more play like that, I guess is my whole point. Um, so to finish it off, Matthews is on pace for 70 goals again. Um, if you, if I was to tell you right now, the over-unders, 69 and a half. Would you put money on the over with me? I would for fun, but I, I wouldn't. It would be a tough one. Uh, <laughs> he's I, been I think just at this off. point, it's hard to bet against it. Yeah, he's been off the rails, and I just feel like it's hard to continue the pace because just hardly anyone in history has been able to do it. So um, I, I think that anyone at the moment, if it was possible to get hit 70, um, I think that he's the man. There's no question. Um, I mean, no one's even on the pace to do it, right? But... Uh, yeah, I would, I don't think it's, it's not impossible. Like it's kind of, he's keeping the door open. So I just mean, it's, it's quite the ask to go without, you know, the whole season without a slump is basically what we're asking for. Yeah. So if you do some quick maths here in his next 15 games, he's on pace to score 12 goals, right? And that would bring him to 50. He needs 20 hit 50 and 50 so he'd have to be play, play even better right 0.85 goals per game you got 30 and 35 um but it's still possible it's sure. still possible a couple of hat trick nights matthew scoring two again um and if he can stay on the pace he might end up like we might be talking about this at like 42 and 42 still he might not do it but he might hold this pace for a little bit longer than we expect well, this is how we got all mixed up with this McDavid versus Matthews talk a couple years ago. It's because Matthews, when he's on it, is just absolutely ridiculous, right? And, I mean, it, it's, it was a far stretch when everyone was trying to, to have that talk. But there's no question that as a goal scorer, like, I can't – when he's on it, there, he's almost unstoppable. And I, I just feel like it's been the – to have that in a more consistent rate has been his problem. And most of it has just only been because of injury. Um, a guy that's had dealt with a lot of hand and like arm wrist injuries. So, but yeah, like he's just spectacular. And I wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if he did go on a run like that, but we might be talking about him. Like he's the best player again. And those conversations would might come up again. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think we can make that mistake still. I think a lot of still media people clearly. will though. <laughs> I think it's still ever clearly Connor McDavid this year with the way that he's oh, been yeah. playing. He's been stupid. Yeah. Um, Really underrated, uh, amazing superstar player that I feel like doesn't get talked about enough about how fucking good he is, is Nathan McKinnon. You guys want to flip into some abs talk? Let's do it. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. So the abs. Nate McKinnon specifically, his yeah. point streak ended the other day. Yeah. Uh, in St. Louis. That's what happened. Mm -hmm. Um, so he's scored five, or yeah, five points since then in the last two games, um, two good, four assists. Not so shabby. <laughs> Not so shabby. Um, but Nate McKinnon, uh, leading the way absolutely with this team, um, with his point getting, um, but really, is it just the points that he's getting that's leading this team or is it his play more than anything? Because I was watching the other night, some highlights of McKinnon this season and uh the guy's a dog to be that skilled and to have that much go in you 
Um, what is it about him that, uh, that makes everybody else so much better? Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's just that fieriness, uh, we see in him, uh, you know, smashing sticks, um, or, you know, if if that kind of translates, you know, with that energy kind of, uh, guys just pick up on that and that get up and go, you know, that he has where he just has those bursts, uh, those speed bursts. And that's something they're tracking now too, uh, with stats is, uh, reading guys, momentary speeds and these speed bursts. And he, he led the NHL in that last year and is leading right now, um, in these bursts of over, over 20, uh, kilometers an hour, miles per hour. I, I don't know. I, I have no is idea. McDavid second. <laughs> um, I think it's miles an hour. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And there was another guy, um, the two, so Nachushkin actually was leading. He had the yeah, record this year so too, far. Yeah, yeah he was wow. like twenty three point like nine four or something or six four. And then Nathan McKinnon and I think it was someone from Winnipeg. I forget who, but uh, they both beat it in like succession in the same night. Um, and then wow. yeah, so so I know he he's a fast guy. He's got all this get up and go. He's got all this energy. Um, the play is great. The points are amazing. I mean. That helps big time. Um, I don't know. It, I, it all kind of rolls in together, I, I think my answer would have to be. It's not just one or the other, really. Um, the fact that his play is so good that he's getting these points, that's helping with the wins and getting a strong team together, stringing together wins, uh, really builds, I know, good culture, good winning culture. I mean, he scores goals like crazy. He scored four the other night against Ottawa. <laughs> Yeah, right? unreal. <laughs> um, like he's unbelievable. But the reason I say this is he has more. Like in the last like twenty games that I can see here that I pulled up uh, on the fantasy app because that's the best way to find the stats. Um, yeah, is he's got more multi assist nights than he has no assist nights. Wow, that's impressive. That is that's yeah. crazy. And like two, it's like two, two, two. Uh, he's got three, three in here. Two nights with three. A uh, bunch of nights with two. And then a whole bunch of nights with one. He's got one night where he had four assists, like five assists one night. Like the or yeah no yeah sorry four goals one point. Um, but yeah, he's just been unbelievable. Um, yeah, multi assists every night. More nights with uh, multi assists than without zero assists. That's crazy. Um, I can't believe that Nathan McKinnon's a real person. I can't believe that we don't <laughs> talk about this guy more. Like on airwaves constantly. I get that he's in Denver. I get that he's. Uh, but he's still a Canadian. Uh, I yep. wonder if maybe more if we had uh, more international play, best on best international play, if we would talk about Nate McKinnon more. Because oh, yeah. this guy is just superstar. unbelievable. And it seems like he doesn't get enough shine in Canadian national television. It's true. Oh. I, I yeah. think that all the time. Because when I follow Av's stuff and watch Av's games, he's like always the first star. And he's always getting interviewed after the games, on the ice, over the arena, at Ball Arena. And the guy's energy in those, even in those, uh, those post-game interviews, sometimes he's, he's got kind of this, like, you can tell he's still coming down from the game and the win, but he like calms down. He's like, yeah, he's like, you know, the guys are playing like, it's really nice to see the guys come in and chip in uh, those extra goals. Like, even though I got four, you know, um, but <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't say that, but you know, like he, he gets, he always, always is humble about the team around him. Uh, and then he knows they've got to, you know, keep their nose to the grindstone for the games coming up. He's talking about uh, playing Dallas, which uh, will be tonight, uh, the time this show comes out, uh, that they're playing. And, uh, you know, these are games that matter. These are, they're looking to be at the top of that division and uh, games against Dallas and Winnipeg and stuff like that. that that's that's what matters. So if Colin was, Flynn, oh, sorry, got it. If there was Olympics and World Cup, like, he would be just an like an international superstar. 100%. I think that when you he just isn't compared to the top players enough. And if you had him like next to Sidney Crosby on the line, and he's by far the better player, everyone would be like, like he would just be loved by every Canadian around. And he really hasn't had his due because of the when he's come into his time, in his prime, right? I mean, no one's had their due basically just because we haven't been in forever, but. Um, yeah, he's he's one of the best players, and he's very rarely not the best player on the ice. I think that's one of the best things about him is a lot of star players disappear for periods of time where just because of his burst of speed and just how fiery and fierce he is out there, I think he, he's almost never the best, not the best player on the ice. 
Yeah, it, it, it. I noticed a lot when we had the Colorado um, Edmonton series in the playoffs last year, and it was like McDavid McKinnon head to head, and because they both do that when they're out there, no matter even if they're not doing anything dangerous, you know it's in every player's mind. Like he could at any second there. do something dangerous, and yeah. or he's just out there. Yeah, he might not even have the puck, and it's like, well, he's out here. We should keep an eye over there. You know. And, oh yeah. So he's always in people's minds and seeing them both together go at it um, and see, you know, it was even, it was like evenly matched. Um, and I think they could be and, on a and, line for Team Canada. <laughs> wouldn't that be incredible? Power play with McKinnon and McDavid. Oh, yeah. wow. Like, yeah, that's <laughs> beyond. I know they talk McDavid, about the Crosby, American. Yeah, Maybe I know they harder. talk about the American players being so great, but like when you just think about it, like McDavid, McKinnon and Crosby on a power play, like, that I just I need to see this. <laughs> like I know. I just, I I'm know. gonna like, not watch the NHL happen. anymore if we don't go into international play. <laughs> like, I know it needs to be, and to it, it needs to be an Olympics, man. It needs to yeah. be a full fledged Olympics. I'm sick of this National Hockey League World Cup shit. Like, show me players from teams doing and that. countries that are not in the NHL. Um, and it's really a bummer that Russia fucking blows a bag of dicks with all this war stuff going on because now you can't have Russia in the hockey thing. And, like, they're a, they were a huge part. And it was great to be able to go and kick the Russians' ass because they were good, right? Russian hockey they players are good. Be. There's lots of them in the NHL. They still would be, um, But sure. they're not allowed to play. Um, so that really sucks. I really hope we do get some international play, though. Like, we need it. We need it. Our generation needs it. We've been deprived for too long. Like, there yeah. was so much international play when I was very young. Uh, and now that I'm a grown-ass adult and would just thrive in this, I don't get to enjoy it at all. There's absolutely no spectacle except for the NHL. You want best on best, NHL is all you get. Any international tournaments, any other tournaments like that, you never get best on best. No, yeah. it, it's true. We used to, you're right, we used to really get it, like, Sackick and Iserman and Rob Blake and, like, just, like, everyone, like, all on the same team. Like, every big yeah. Canadian you've ever could imagine, we're all there. They were, just, and, like, Patrick Law and Brodeur and, oh, we would and dream Roberto about Luongo. Do you remember that? That was just, like, <laughs> stupid. Yeah, and, like, Luongo was a third goalie or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, <laughs> well what's the, how are you going to put Luongo? So, well, okay, because we have Martin Brodeur and Patrick Waugh. Like, what do you want yeah. us to do? <laughs> Yeah, what yeah you, like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we cut like ten other awesome goalies too, just so you know. Like, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, like, In the prime of Canadian goalies, really, like, really. Yeah. Patrick Waugh, what a what a stud, what an amazing, yeah, what amazing such a crime player. against hockey, really, because it's just not. It's like the NHL is just so nearsighted, where they just don't see how it's like not going international is harming their product so much. There'd just be so many more fans at this point if we were. Oh yeah, had been it going helped make all these legends years. of these players that were already legends like Sack and yeah. Heisman. But those things go in that list. Oh, McKinnon. and the Olympic We'd be gold McKinnon and, the... and, and exactly. McDavid and yeah. Crosby. Like I mean, we've already seen Crosby, right? But like, it, like I want to see McKinnon and McDavid and and like the yeah. the guys who would have literally never even sniffed it. Like I would love to. I would love to have that. I mean, the Avs have always been my second favorite team. Always since I was like six or seven years old, I started following the sport, and that was because the Leafs sucked when I was a kid. And when you play video games, you want to play with a good team. You know who was a good team in two thousand and one? The Colorado Avalanche. So yeah. I fell in love. Right, used them all the time. Got to know all the players. Um, had favorites. Um, Peter Forsberg, one hundred percent, was my guy. Um, anyways, going back. Uh, yeah, Nathan McKinnon would be in that same conversation yeah. with all these guys we're talking about only if there was best on best play. Yeah. Um, so moving on, uh, Ross Colton said, Colleen Flynn tweeted this, and I don't know whether he said it to her, to a scrum, but he said, as per Colleen Flynn of the Hockey News, uh, that the team needs to get their game going right out of the gate. So what is it about the Avs that they need to do to start tonight to start right? I guess, I mean, goal. yeah, that, I mean, that's the Good obvious analysis, answer, right? Is get on the board first. Um, <laughs> Put McKinnon out there. <laughs> yeah, um, it, but it's kind of, it, it's just even how you look at the game and, and your perspective. Are you going to go in and try and set up passing plays? And, or are you just going to drive the net? Are you going to try and get a dirty goal right away? Like something you might look for late in the game or just like try something crazy even. Like how, how what's what's their perspective? And I think going out there with no you know no hesitation no uh you know 
what are they, like being pensive and just like sitting back none of that like uh, just go out there and be fiery be fierce um i think that's what they got to do because if they show these other teams that right out of the gate um you know there's something to be feared they don't have to play down to teams they got they can they can scare teams right off the bat that's that's what i like yeah absolutely i think that they uh i think they need to go out there and put a goal in the net that's how they're that's how they need to go. Yeah, I mean that's time. that's the obvious. Yeah, just, of course. Just, just go score first, and then score again, and then score one more time, and then don't <laughs> blow it. Maybe and score that's... a few more times for insurance because you could blow a three goal lead in the third period to the Arizona Coyotes. I'm a little bit sour about that. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, that was a tough one. I didn't <laughs> that like that. Sucked. But sucked. <laughs> they kind of got that back against the Islanders. We had a nice comeback win against the Islanders. Took it to OT and got the win, and it felt like a little bit of like. Uh, you know, just on the other end of one of those, which is always nice to get. Um, another thing, uh, yeah, like obviously about goals, uh, if we could just go and score, score the first goal, score another, score another. The Avs are like second right now in goals for percentage per game and like percentage and just numbers wise. Um, they've got 38 goals, I think, or what is it? Uh, 38 games, sorry, and 138 goals. Um, so that's... Uh, Quick math, 3.63% uh, of their, you know, every 3.63 uh, goals every game. Um, so that's not bad. Um, that's so pretty it's pretty good. It's second in the league behind uh, Vancouver. But hey. here's the thing. We got shut that's, out three yeah. games this year, right? This is and something you guys. Crazy. Wow. That's crazy. That's right. crazy. So, You're second in the league. Oh, my God. Yeah. So three, I know. So three of the games this year, I did the math on this too because, Three, you guys don't know about these shutouts. You've been how many? A hundred and whatever games. We went yeah. three ga- like two in a row we got shut out, and then another one like a week later. So Wasn't if like you do three that same five math, games, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was bad. That's like three so out of five dumb. games we were shut out. So if you do that same math, um, 138 goals in 38 games. If you do that without the shutout games, that's only 35 games. So in the games that we're scoring, you know, that we actually do score, that's 3.94 goals. So just wow. under four goals a game um, on average when we are scoring. When we're not scoring, we're not going to win. And this is when wow. it comes this – is, this is how I want to transition into Georgie is because if we don't score, we don't win. There's nothing our goalie can do about that. We have to score. When we do score, it's, it's just around four goals a game. So let's, let's go and do that. Um, Georgie back there doesn't have great save percentage. Goals against, not great. But he's got a lot of wins, right? That was the thing we were going to talk about. And I and he, he's leading the league in wins, in fact. Um, and that's kind of all this team needs, right? And we, we saw this when they won, and we talked about Kemper. Do, do we need, like, a lot of teams need a really good goalie to go through the playoffs. The Avs need a goalie who can let in less than four goals. That's all we need. <laughs> like, There's a lot of those out there. <laughs> sad, yeah, that's craziness. Yeah, no, you're not wrong either. As long as we're There's scoring. That's to back it up. Like, yeah, that's so crazy. You guys got shut out three times and you're second in the league in goals for talk about yeah. firepower. And they got yes. rid of a guy that was supposed to score for them and Thomas Tatar that didn't and just didn't do anything. Yeah. It's and just, is yeah, we've got to enough add guys still. more forward depth in this like coming up. So like this team's about to get even better. <laughs> yeah. 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 Things can be scary. Mind. But yeah, yeah, Georgie with 20, 20 wins. So he's got two more than Hellebuck who I thought was the leader. If you were to just ask, sit here and ask me right now with the way the Jets have been and how much he plays, True. I would have said hella buck. Um, but Georgie's got two more wins than him, not just one sitting at this day today with an 898 save percentage. Like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So should they be getting 900. a goalie and not a forward? <laughs> I, I don't know I... about this. Yeah. Yeah. Like, that's the thing. Like, maybe, like, we talked about Markstrom, and I, I think I mentioned injured reserve, and I was incorrect on that. I do want to correct myself on that because mm. I was thinking of Gustafsson. But, anyways, because they're my two goalies in fantasy. It's my I mind. See, just, okay. geez, you know, yeah. You know how that works. Um, but, yeah. so, anyway, so Markstrom could be a viable option. But, yeah, and that's it, though. Dude, so we don't, our, we our may or trade. may not need it, though. I mean, as long as he can keep under four, like, four goals against a game, we can, we can go out and score four. I know we right. can. <laughs> and like so your backup one. and backup after that could probably do that too so <laughs> well and that's the thing prosvetov we mentioned earlier in the show too like what if the abs had this injury stuff the leafs are dealing with what mm. would we do you know and i think again as long as the prosvetov could keep out four goals <laughs> you know only let in three we'd be okay 
You guys hear that? No, I was like, what's, what's what? going on over there? What are you, what are you hearing going on around here? Uh, oh, really? Oh, my God. Yeah. Roof falling in. <laughs> glad, you can't, glad you can't hear that. Sorry. So, <laughs> it's just like, if you can hear it, it's going to be very interrupting. Sorry. <laughs> Construction going on in the studio over at Webby's. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> bang, bang, yeah. <laughs> Goddamn roommates. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think, yeah, I think we wouldn't be as, uh, you know, out, out, <laughs> we wouldn't be as out to, uh, out, you know, like, uh, up the Creek, I should say, um, if, if Georgie was injured, um, he just needs to just, yeah, string together some wins and that's all you need to do in the playoffs, score more than the other team and win more than the other team. And so far we're statistically doing that. So <laughs> Vegas has, well, bet three, six, five anyways, has Colorado, as the underdogs tonight against Dallas. Do you think that's okay. right? Whoa. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to take that. Um, I haven't I haven't thought of that in a long time. Um, it's been a while. It's been a while, um, so, you know, <laughs> since we've been the yeah. underdogs. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's so, like I don't know, They're man. plus that's, 105 that's to the to Dallas Stars, one, minus 125. Um, and so it's close. They, yeah. I guess, but they are the puck line's good. Like they clearly aren't going to lose by more than one and a half. Um, it has it at two forty. So they're where pretty... does that come? I, like I don't know where it comes from because Dallas is obviously like hot scoring wise. Um, so are the Abs obviously. Um, Dallas is goaltending. They've got Wedgwood uh, filling in for an injured Ottinger over the last while, and Wedgwood save percentage is nothing to write home about. It's below nine hundred, I believe, in his last like six or seven starts. Um, we've got Georgie obviously on the other end. The matchup is on paper f- fairly even. Um, I just think it's a big matchup. Um, and where is it in Dallas or is it in Colorado? Ooh, like maybe that's, that's a great maybe question. that's the edge. Like, that, yeah, that, that might, might be, be the edge, um, depending on their road records and whatever. Also, right. sometimes uh, it depends on uh, how the game went last time. Yes. Did Dallas Three, win last it's in time? Dallas. I it's believe in Dallas. They, they, there you go. Okay, it's yeah. in Dallas, and I do believe they have the the season record against us. If I'm not mistaken, yeah, yeah. I mean, that would be a smart bet. I would probably take that bet. Yeah, that wouldn't be a bad one, honestly, because I think the Abs are gonna, yeah, come out pretty hot tonight. And Wedgwood, he had kind of a rough game against Montreal the other night. Um, um, but they, that's the thing is Dallas scored first that game in like the first eight seconds of the game or something. Montreal won the faceoff, took it back behind their net went to pass it out and totally bobbled it and gave it right to the Dallas Stars and he, Stars player and he scored. And the goalie just looked dumbfounded. He was like, why, guys? Like, why did you even bring it back here? Like, don't. Yeah. Go that yeah. way. Go that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I don't trust you to come back here. Can yeah. the blue line. <laughs> so oh, there was brutal. that. But So, yeah, Dallas scores a lot. So, I don't know. They can, they're a kind of team, too, that can get by with a goalie like Wedgwood with a save percentage under 900. So, it's going to be an interesting game for sure. Yeah, totally. Um, So, that's all I have on the Avs. Uh, Who's scoring tonight, Ted? Uh, McKinnon. Uh, one. <laughs> you um, took the free square. <laughs> yeah. I took, yeah. Okay, <laughs> that, that one's the free one for sure. But I got to say some of the, some of our, um, you know, our, uh, Previous Dallas stars, uh, we've got Kivy Ranta, uh, Golovson, and Nichushkin True. were all former stars. Um, so I think some of them might, you know how players play against their old uh, organization, their old club sometimes. Yeah. I think oh, we Dallas know. definitely going to get one. We are well yeah, aware, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't mean it like uh, that, but yeah. I think Ross um, Colton scores tonight. Oh, yeah? Okay. I don't know. Okay. What about you, Webby? You got a, got a prediction? Uh, I like your I like your Dallas thoughts. I'm gonna go into Chushkin. Yeah, yeah, he's Choo-choo. on fire. All right, so we got a little bit more to talk about from the last show. If you guys got time, uh, do we still have time left? Let's do it. Yeah. All right, uh, so let's flip into. What the fuck is happening? So the World Juniors wrapped up and Canada lost. I think we talked about that already. Um, Canada's playing in the Spengler Cup as well. Uh, I haven't checked in in a few days on them. But uh, they are favorites in a lot of the games they're playing. Canada's always good. Uh, Craziness coming from the Spengler Cup, though. Um, We have a video here that came on Twitter. And uh, it's 
a coach. Um, I can't remember the coach's name right now. I'm going to have to look this back up. But uh, the, the player is Thomas Jerko, and he's on the bench uh, playing in the Spangler Cup, and his coach tries to get his attention like this. Yeah. Beneficiaries of an excellent non-goal call by Josh Holden. Wow. So that was from Josh Holden, who is the coach of that team, on Thomas Jerko. Um, and I can't believe that I just saw that. Um, whether yeah. it is the coach grabbing him and yelling at him like that might be something that makes you uncomfortable and unacceptable. The flying elbow that comes from the player that clearly didn't appreciate his coach doing that to him. Um what is your guys' takes on that situation? I have to ask. We've done this before. Is that okay? Yeah, no. I think that's ugly from the coach. Uh, the yeah. way he grabs him and yanks him. Uh, if you can't see the video, you're just listening. Yeah, he grabs him right kind of by the under the shoulder pad, kind of by the neck, yanks him right back, and just starts screaming what you heard. And at one point, the player must say something back. I couldn't hear exactly, but he goes, don't fucking yell at me like that. After he's just fucking tearing into him like a crazy person. So I, I, I don't know. Um, and... Maybe I shouldn't even say that, but the way he's he's yelling at him is is off the. It's unhinged. It's it's not it's not right. I don't think it's okay. What about you, CP? Yeah, I mean the the flying elbow is totally justified. I think that <laughs> yeah. might have been like, don't come at me. I don't know if the guy he must have said something too, but I mean, I I wish he connected because totally uncalled for. Actually, I'm probably glad that he did. What if he did? Yeah, I was gonna say that would be just such a you know a show that we do oh. not want to have, but totally unacceptable by that coach wouldn't be shocked if you know he's not a coach <laughs> so that's davos yeah. coach by the way hc davos who's in i was gonna say um, yeah um and yeah so josh holden um i i've seen play i've seen coaches yell at players and i've seen them go i've seen them tap them on the shoulder um i've seen them get right down in their ear and sure. yell. Um, yeah but i've never seen a coach that aggressively grab a player um Sorry, I keep looking away. I just keep watching this again and again. This is like, <laughs> he just, he, he grabs him initially. And after the elbow, instead of realizing that you've gone too far and cooling off in the moment, which I think that's what you need as a leader, um, he pulls him back. Like, yeah. no, no, I'm the boss. Showing yeah. the, the alpha aggression um, to try and win the, the ego battle or whatever battle of, um, whatever you want to call it, like the, I'm your boss and you need to do what I, I say, but that's not how you lead. That no. is, yeah. what does that you do never for your lead, players? You never lead with negativity. Um, and if you want to yell and you're yelly type, um, there are people like that. There are coaches like that. I've had coaches like that. I've had coaches I hate that yell at me. I've had coaches I love that yell at me. That they, they, they just push and they push. And like at the end of it, you're like, I'm so much better because of it. Like I get the yelling and I get the pushing, I get the aggression, but you keep you keep your fucking hands off the people, right? And That's at exactly the end of the it. day, even if you do cross the line, if you're gonna be a leader and in that position, when he throws his elbow back, have the fucking gumption and the brains to let go and remove yourself from that situation because clearly you've crossed the line. Instead, yeah. he doubles down by yanking the player back. So, no, I think Josh Holden probably I, – I don't know if he's going to have be tainted as a coach from this. Like, he's coaching H.C. Davos. I have no idea <laughs> what to say. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. really want to put it down. But, like, like yeah. is he really, like, NHL coming up material? He doesn't look old. But, like, at the end of the day, you really have to think that hurts his resume, just this video here. You can't do that shit. Cameras are everywhere. And yeah. now you're famous on the Internet for being a prick. Yeah, and the way he kind of ends it, too, he goes, like, that's all I'm asking. Like – he no, tries to deflect. All you're doing like, is being a prick. You're not yeah. just asking something. No, you're no, overreacting, you're over and crossing grabbing lines. Me when I don't yeah. listen, when you think I'm not listening to you, when I fucking heard you, but my head's in the game and I'm not paying. Like, have we not talked about that? Was Keith not bearing into somebody one time, and he just like we were talked about the like their heads are just in the game, right? They're not. They, it's not that they're ignoring the coach that they don't listen. It was they're just yeah, it was bunting. Okay, so that that's the talk. That's been a conversation. Um, and you know, like he's not necessarily not listening to him. 
he just the coach didn't get the satisfaction that he wanted so he had to go and get more right that wasn't good enough so now i have to step it up so i can feel the satisfaction that i'm looking for and that's that's little man that's fucking i, I hate to be like that like i don't want to degrade any person a little like but like it's it's stupid it's very small thinking it's small-minded thinking it's uh very uh terrible of a person i i, I don't even can't even have the words i'm so worked up it's so fucking dumb i just straight up how do you be so stupid how do you be yeah. so stupid as to get yourself into that situation in the first place um putting putting your hands on a player in national tv um which i'm sure like yeah, that's broadcasted all over the place right uh we don't necessarily have huge coverage of it here but i'm sure for other european countries with other players it's it's big over there it's hockey right it's in their time zone people are watching it and for him to pull that stunt, I just think that it's uh, it's despicable. It's not worth seeing him go any further. Like, you, you fucked up. You need to go out and take a sit for a bit and maybe come back after you come back with receipts of, like, you've done programs and learned that you shouldn't do this shit because that's not okay. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I would add, too, like, the, the Bunting and Keefe situation, we knew, like, there was a history there. And so I wonder if there's a history here where this isn't the first time that they've argued and... You know, maybe not the first time he's grabbed him. It's just the first time it's on camera. So I wonder if there's some inside knowledge from like people within that team that know a bit more where maybe, you know, this is the last straw. Maybe this is the first time. Maybe this coach is, you know, a, a saint and this is the first time he's ever done anything. Right. Like um, you need a little bit more knowledge on the situation, but um, definitely just not the way to lead. I do think that uh, screaming is like a sometimes a like I shouldn't say necessary because not everybody does it, but it's a, a strategy it's a style. And like I, I have two coaches in my life in basketball that were like super influential. One was just like total love at all times. The other one was like scream 90% of the time, but 10% was love. And at no point did I ever think that he was like crossing a line where, you know, I was going to be in like physically harmed. Right. There's just like that clear defined line where yelling's fine i mean you can't just like get up and spitting in someone's face yelling screaming but you know you can raise your voice but as soon as you touch an, a player like that's just a line that you just there's absolutely no reason to to go there no it should be all in the means of motivating like if you're raising your voice you're going hey like come on like you know and and yelling out the systems and the plays and reminding players that are halfway across the ring and if you're talking to a guy that's right there and you're raising your voice you're you're getting them uh, on an energy level. You're you're bringing you're bringing them up, getting them up to go. You're not yelling well, at him. Like I don't mind yelling at. He, like if it, like, like mean, the the situation with Bunting and Keith, like Bunting is a player and he admitted it. That is motivated and needs to a kick in the butt sometimes. And like and there's a a deeper love there where they had like 20 years of experience yeah. with each other, right? So like I'd say that it's all situational, right? But um, That's definitely sure. a lot. You don't want to do too much of the yelling at someone but no i mean it like whether it's con it can like uh criticism it should be constructive uh constructive criticism in some way um even if you're saying hey that play was wrong uh that you did you know it, it's next time do this or you know what we talked about at practice and they're like yes yes yeah. i do like you know like, it can't yes. be unhinged and like exactly got it. yeah there's got to be some inside knowledge uh, somewhere about that in history and something because it's been days. This is four days ago that this happened. Scott Wheeler is where I saw this. Scott C. Wheeler on Twitter. Um, and I, I think that by now we would have heard uh, something coming from Josh Holden. Right. Who, uh, do you recognize that name, CP? Because he's a former Canuck. Leave it to a Canuck. Uh, actually, well, you had to say that, <laughs> but I mean, I do now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, not John's nothing funny. huge, but yeah, I do remember that name. So, um, yeah, uh, that's pretty much all I have to say about that. Josh Holden, yeah, fucking moron, get your act together, be better. Yeah, you gotta figure it out. Uh, so last time we got cut short on the PWHL, and I just have a couple more points that I wanted to get through. I think. Um, yeah. So, they're wearing full face cages versus visors. Uh, right. First question I want you guys both to answer is, do you like it? The second question is, do you think it needs to be that way? I was kind of half expecting it to be visors for some reason. I don't know why. But the other part of me kind of knew that it probably would be cages 
um, in a new league. Um, I think that's what um, a lot of them are used to as well, in depending what other leagues they're coming from um, and what international play they're doing. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess it's probably a good call starting up a new league. Uh, totally eliminates any risk of nasty injuries you just don't want to see, you know. Um, so I don't know. I, I think maybe it could change, though. I'm totally open for it changing. I think visors would be cool, obviously. Uh, I'd like to see their faces. Yeah, why not? Okay, I'm going to sound like I've never watched a women's game before, and it's not true, just maybe not enough. But haven't they've never worn just the visor, right? No. Right. So um, I like when it when it was brought up, I hadn't thought about it. Like I was just like, oh, like, that would be much cooler. Um, right. You know, like because then you get to know the people a bit more. I think that's one of the great things of a zoom in on the bench is you get to see like you get to know each player individually and how they're reacting. That's why we love yep. uh, Bertuzzi so much because like he's such a weirdo, right? <laughs> and like you <laughs> know, you right. just you love to see you those to see type that. of things, and it's an extra level of in, um, like of, of to like see them as a personality. Yeah. But I don't think it's it gets in the way in any way. Like I think we still can. Um, and I just, I, I didn't think about it, but it would be cool. I'm sure it was the, the, like the player's decision though. Yeah. Like I think a lot of things went through a lot of the players and a lot of the people who were part of, you know, the coaching systems in the league and the, the boards and the people who are doing this are people who have been involved in women's hockey and around the sport for a long, long time. So, I mean, they know, they know what they're doing. It's, I think it's, they made the decision based on a lot of, uh, you know, educated input and, you know, uh, stuff, you know, people who know what they're talking about. So, so yeah, we'll, we'll see where it goes. Most so, decisions were made by the players. Like the logistics of everything are obviously there's a team of people doing all that, but um, like there was so much that was just ran by the players. And I can't imagine that this was, you know, an exception unless maybe it's something that just never got addressed and they just went with, you know, a rule set that everyone was used to. And, you know, I guess that's something that can be negotiated or, talked about with the players associations but um yeah i think when you guys made the point earlier that uh, they do it in international play and that's what they've always done and i think maybe if they're gonna continue to play in those tournaments and stuff um that that they just want to do what they're used to um also i have kind of a cheeky joke here that like women do live longer than men um maybe everybody should wear the full face shield (laughs) because then you wouldn't lose teeth and break bones in your face and things like that um that also wouldn't work for fighting. Um, it just whatever, whatever. The point is, um, I wonder how the good they off could be in in just those. Uh, peel it off. I wonder if they could be in those fish bowls. Because remember, Mitch Marner in a fish bowl, he lit the league up. Oh yeah, it's not right. like they hinder you. But people do say that the the cages are harder to play with. It's harder to see. Um, so I wonder if we see a lot more fish bowls. I wonder if that ends up being a thing. Well, that's, that's an option that's because I point. I saw multiple people with the fish bowl. So uh, it is an option that they all have. Yeah, and I wonder if the new generations come up and adapt to that. I think I wonder mm. if they're going to say like, "No, nah, I'd rather not a cage. I'd rather, I'd rather use the fishbowl. It might be easier to see." Uh, I don't know because I've heard a lot that like I've never played with a cage, um, but if you have a cage on, I, I've heard it's a lot harder to see through the cage and play with the puck. Actually, I have played with a cage when I was really young, and yeah. when you, you were trying to play hockey, and I was like eight or nine. Yeah, I remember that, and you had to wear a stupid helmet with a cage. Yeah. Um, I never played competitively though, right, boys? So like, I barely yeah, have these right. memories. But like, okay, I remember skating and not being able to see. But I was also a poor skater at that age, anyways. So, <laughs> one thing yeah, that I've every... noticed with with the even the cages and the bubbles is that they they're not so close to your chin. Uh, like the ca- the bubble comes out and there's and it's more graded because like a, a big issue used to be that they would just fog up all the time, and so I think right. they've just designed them better where they don't. Um, oh yeah, and that's why people chose the the cage over the fishbowl because like if you get fogged up you can't even play so um, yeah the bottom yeah. half is like a cage made of like the plastic like the clear yeah plastic. like it's open to it's breathe very open stuff yeah yeah um and sits off the, day, the chin strap more too yeah yeah some of the cages come right near your chin too so uh some of the hits you take uh, you get a lot of i remember wearing the cages back in the day so many cuts under the chin from just getting bumped around and the the cage comes up the little fo- piece of foam slips upwards and the the metal catches you right on the chin um mm-hmm. so yeah the cages can be annoying for a lot of reasons i, I wore them for many years uh, playing hockey until uh, i think well up until until we were 18 you had to wear them uh 
in most of the leagues I was in. Um, and then, but I mean, here's the thing too: is a lot of people who play hockey, we're playing hockey not just in a league. Uh, there's times you're right. at playing shinny, you're doing this, and most of those times you're either barely wearing a helmet or you've taken your cage off completely, not even a visor. You're just out there with a bucket or a ball cap or whatever. Um, so a lot of people are comfortable, and I'm sure a lot of these women players are too, comfortable being out there with no face shield at all, really. But um, if that's the way the league wants it and they're all comfortable with it, which, again, if it was run by them or not, I'm sure they are at least comfortable with it and have the they're option. So. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I think I think so it's a good thing for, for right now. Um, so the next thing I wanted to ask about, uh, you're watching the game, uh, you look up to the top of the screen, and you see the goals. <laughs> and then you look down, and you want to know how many shots are on net. And the PWHL did not have that broadcast on Sportsnet. Um, what did you think of that, CP? I mean, I didn't like I, the the whole scoreboard was just like big and clunky and no shots. I like I, I wasn't a big fan. Not that it's a huge deal. It didn't affect my like viewing the game. I just a l- little details that I think need some work. You know, I wonder if it's like because I noticed too you can't track stats on any of the sports apps yet either. And so I wonder if you know are there stat trackers? Is that a an employee that's being employed at the moment? You know, like. There's not, they're just in the, it's six months since they decided to do this league, right? So, I mean, little things like that just maybe aren't in place yet. And I'm sure, you know, the apps will start, you know, covering their stats and, and, you know, we'll get shot trackers. Um, Little things like that, I don't think affect the overall game, but details that definitely make it better for viewers. I think, yeah, and that stuff comes with time. I mean, if you're watching us on YouTube, go back and watch our first episode. Uh, we look and sound like shit, so we've come a long way. I think they'll come a long way. Everything that starts right. off, you know, what, go back and watch that first episode. Once there's been 100 games, it's going to look uh, great. But I think the, you know, the display in the corner and the, the player names coming up after the goal, the goal and the assists, and the little picture of the player in the corner, Yeah, um, right. it'll all yeah, be We have there, episodes yeah. where I'm not even here. Yeah, so. I know. Craig didn't even exist at <laughs> yeah. one point in time. Wasn't even a person yet. Or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hell, we used to be hockey talk. <laughs> yeah, we had a whole other name when wow. we first started. We were only. I on didn't the radio. even know that. <laughs> yeah, we weren't even a News podcast. to me. <laughs> we were only on the radio. Yeah. yeah. It was old school. Yeah. Terrestrial radio. He was Evie. Yeah, Jay and Evie. Now we're uh, producer Ted Jay and Evie. And CP. Yeah. Nice. What's up? Hey, yeah, what's up? Shout letters. out Amherst Island Radio for hooking us up and giving us our start. Um, I can't find the actual stat here. Um, I'm pretty sure it was Haley Salvian that tweeted it, but I can't find it. The first uh, PWHL game between Toronto and New York got like 800,000 viewers. It was like 794,000 viewers from what I remember. Uh, that's huge. And you're saying like, maybe they don't have stat trackers and it all came together so fast. People are really taking this seriously, I think. Uh, and I think that like little details, like the shots on screen, they, it should be similar. Like I am very used to watching a game and being able to judge how a game is going by how many shots have hit the net. Right. Yep. And like, you see a team and it's like, Oh, it's like, I have no idea what the actual shots were, and I watched every second of that Toronto New York game. I never even went and looked back. I didn't count myself, so I have no idea what the end of shots were. But it could have been like twenty-five to ten, and I go, "Oh no, that's not good," right? But it's nice to to have that. (laughs) And nice to it's nice to have that on screen. In my opinion, I just think it should be there. Like it's something we're used to having. It's it's a way that I've adapted myself to watch these games. Like I don't know why they wouldn't do it. They need to take it as seriously as the viewers are because it's going to be big and everybody is very into this yeah oh, they're, it's they're I mean, even it. if you're at arenas uh nhl arenas small like even uh, ohl arenas they've got uh, like four to eight shot clocks around the arena so you can always see it at all times it's up on the jumbotron as well uh yeah it's it's an important thing to see while watching a game yeah. good thing to know but all so these I, things it'll, require it'll an come. employee so that's right that's a good point is the logistics of it all making it happen not only having it there but yeah someone counting the stats and uh yeah in clicking clicking the counter making it go up one yeah one one (laughs) two Two. one two (laughs) (laughs) so oh mark mark andre Fleury here i have have a a stat here that i want to talk about uh flipping out of pwhl 
Um, I didn't realize that this was this, but Mark Andre Fleury is the fourth goalie in NHL history to play a thousand games. Right? That happened a week or two ago. Yeah. Um, do you know who's right in front of him? Patrick Waugh. Yeah, he's close on his heels, eh? Twenty nine games. One thousand twenty nine wow. games. Patrick Waugh played. Uh, Mark Andre Fleury is very likely to pass that probably next year. Uh, I don't know if he'll get 29 games in for the rest of the year. Might be close. Be close. Yeah, Gustafson right? out right now. He'll he'll pick up a few more right now. Yeah, be close. I mean, that's that'd be but, like the majority of the share. That'd be that uh, yeah, like 40 games left. Everybody has about 40. So he's playing 29. They get 12 starts. It'll from probably be next else. Year. I think it'd be about that if he was a heavy load goaltender. But like he's only like 39 years old. He made his 26,000th save recently. That's incredible. Yeah, twenty six thousand saves. Unreal. Like that's so many pucks. He's fired a little at long you. in the tooth. I don't know. Can he play that many games in that time? Like, who knows? I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. But be crazy to see. But shout out to him. Yeah, two uh, two records. So he's uh, also passing Patrick Waugh. Uh, Patrick Waugh had twenty five thousand eight hundred saves, and he passed him obviously a little while ago few hundred shots ago i don't know how many games that is i think about 30 shots a game i don't know 10 games ago like eight <laughs> games ago somewhere in there he would have mm-hmm. passed them um anyways so you look back and uh patrick watt had that for i don't know 20 some years like how long has he been retired yeah. now like, really he's been retired a long time right like 19 year 18 years i don't know like when did patrick wall retire well how like it, i know it was like well he would have won 2000, the, uh, 2023 so it's not 20 maybe 15 years and nobody else has come through so we haven't had a goalie like this that's been this good in a really long time uh that was my whole point i just want to give flurry shout out for that big time um yeah the last thing that i have here for the podcast boys at the beginning of the year the two teams that were favored to win the Stanley Cup yeah. were tied at the top. And they were the Colorado Avalanche and the Toronto Maple Leafs. Yep, I remember that. Now, halfway through the season, still at the top, is the Colorado Avalanche. Wow. And the New York Rangers. Ooh. Yeah. Not the Toronto Maple Leafs. Toronto no. is now in like fifth but they're tied i seen as of today they are tied with boston vegas dallas and i think carolina uh to win the cup at like uh, they're like tied for third or whatever but uh yeah things have changed colorado's kept their uh their product well and they've kept their stock high but the leaves have dropped big time and that's stanley cup odds we were watching those uh, all summer and at the beginning of the preseason coming into this. And I just can't believe that the Leafs have fallen from, I mean, it, it was plus 750 for the Avs tied with the Rangers um, at plus 750 in the graphic I have. I think that could be changed today. Um, but the Leafs had dropped down to plus 1200. Jeez. That's a big drop. Yeah. Yeah. The one thing, like a lot of people that were, doing like hockey people doing predictions didn't have the Leafs as top two. And a lot of betting numbers have to do with how many people are betting on that team. And so at the beginning of the year, everyone bets on their favorite team. And as we know, there's a lot of Toronto Maple Leafs fans. And so we get a, you get a lot of bets that are just fan bets. And so that offsets the numbers. They're not exactly like who is the best prediction. It's based on how the, the sports book doesn't want to go broke if all these Leaf fans actually hit it and, you know, they're giving them good numbers. So, um, but now I think <laughs> it's the, more if realistic. If the Leafs win the cup, like they're going to go broke. Like the oh, yeah. sports books are going to, they're not going to pay out so much money to people who place these bets every year to keep them afloat. <laughs> yeah. We'll never financially recover from this. <laughs> yeah. I've actually heard some sports book people that talk about that where once in a while there's a bet where it's just like, they watch it because there's so many people that have placed it that like it's a big payout for a betting website or company um, if that bet goes on. So there's like a lot of executives sitting there just like, please, no, please, no, please. And that's probably <laughs> one of them is the least. <laughs> Absolutely. Least win in the cup. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's all I got for the show. Do you guys have any final thoughts before we wrap up? No, I don't think no. so. No. All right. Go out. Well, that's. That's it then. That's a wrap. 
Thank you for listening, for joining us here on Split the Defense Hockey Podcast. Please make sure to like the podcast on whatever platform you're watching or listening on. Subscribe on YouTube. Rate us five stars anywhere else. Find us on X at STDP Hockey and search for Split the Defense everywhere else to stay up to date with what we're doing. See you next time, which will be a Leafs post-game show. Probably really fucking late. Um, but we will be there. Yes, we will. Uh, See you next time. Peace. 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 You've been listening to Split the Defense. A Toronto Maple Leafs, Colorado Avalanche, and NHL podcast. Hosted by Jordan Webster, Craig Pierce, and producer Ted Evans. Split the the is presented by the Forest Electrical Contractors. Professional and efficient service since 2004. Serving the Kingston and surrounding areas.